We are still in chapter six of Perkyavos, mission number six. These are the famed 48 ways to wisdom. Our sages distilled for us 48 different pathways to achieve divine wisdom. And we're up to way number 34. Ohev es hatochachos, someone who loves criticism. You love criticism. If you want to have a portal to wisdom, a portal to Torah, one of the ways to do it is to love critique, to love criticism, to love when people point out your flaws, your shortcomings, where you went wrong. Now, this is something that the Torah embraces, the idea of people criticizing other people, pointing out the areas that they need to improve. This is a concept the Torah embraces. In fact, it's a mitzvah. You must surely rebuke your fellow man. You see someone acting inappropriately, you cannot say, not my problem. Don't yeah, don't see no evil. Don't hear no evil. Nothing like that. I'm just not my problem. It's their issue. No, it's your issue as well. Their sin affects you. Their sin affects the world. And if you care for them, if you love them, if you have any interest in their well-being, you're going to do whatever you can to help them notice and, and, and discover and hopefully address their shortcoming, their flaw. So it's actually a mitzvah. In fact, the mitzvah highlights the fact that it must be done, it, it, it's an imperative. Hochech, tochech. You should surely rebuke. It doesn't say you should rebuke. Hochech. Samisacha. You should rebuke your fellow man. Hochech, tochech. You should rebuke and continually rebuke your fellow man so they behave properly. And the Talmud says, because the, the Torah didn't just say hochech, rebuke. It says hochech, tochech, rebuke, rebuke. That's how to teach us. That even, if, even if you have to do it a hundred times. You rebuke once, it doesn't work. You do it again. You try it again until it works. Now, of course, the Torah is talking about the giver of the rebuke. And here we're talking about the receiver of the rebuke, the recipient of the criticism. And we're told you must not just tolerate it. You must love it. If you want to achieve wisdom, one of the ways to do it is to love criticism, to love the rebuke of others. That's admirable, and that is a way to become wiser. Now, why would anyone enjoy hearing criticism, enjoy rebuke? Isn't it quite unpleasant when someone points out what you did wrong? Isn't it painful? Isn't it perhaps embarrassing? Don't we tend to recoil and get defensive when we're criticized? Who are they? Are they any better than me? You have all sorts of flaws and you're opening your mouth. We tend to view criticism as an attack and we get defensive. But if you think about it, it only makes sense to be defensive when someone gives you rebuke only if you, if you're working under the impression that you're a finished product, that you're perfect. If you have an attitude that presupposes that you're you're perfect, well, okay, you're attacking something which is perfect already. And then the criticism seems to be offline. Only if you are operating under the assumption that you're perfect already, only then does the notion that you have any flaws, any mistakes, any shortcomings, only then is it problematic, only then is it irksome. But the truth is, we're all a work in progress. And we're not infallible. In fact, the definition of human life is that we're flawed. And we're a hybrid. We've got a body. We've got the soul. We've got the eight sara. We have all this work to do to prove ourselves. There are things that are perfect. Even creations that are perfect. We call them angels. They're perfect. They're flawless. And they don't have the free will. And they cannot improve. And they cannot regress. They are omdim in the words of Scripture. They stand. They're stationary. They are static. They are what they are, what they are, and they don't change. We're not like that. We're dynamic. And the Talmud tells us, Lo nitna Torah The Torah was not given to the angels. Why not? Shouldn't they? They're so lofty, so ethereal, so heavenly, so special, so spiritual. They should have the Torah. No. The Torah, that's the complete, comprehensive toolkit 
to improve, to upgrade, to change. To improve, to upgrade, to change. And that presupposes that we're flawed. And there's room for improvement. And there's room for change. So criticism is a central part of this entire ecosystem. We're not perfect. We're flawed. And we have the Torah. And we have, hopefully, good friends that will help us find our way, stumble our path towards improvement, towards progress. So criticism, it's a good thing because it points us in the right direction of where we need to go to improve, which is the agenda of our life. And part of this is, you know, we're blind often to our shortcomings. We don't know necessarily where our flaws lie. And we recoil at the notion of those flaws because that's what the Yitzhara wants us to do. The Yitzhara wants us to have that framework where we're perfect. We don't need to improve. That's, that, that's what it's designed to do, to make sure that we don't improve. It's the foil to Torah. If we didn't be Yitzhara, we would just follow the Torah and improve step after step until we're like angels, even better. The Yitzhara wants us to say, no, you're good enough now. No need to improve. And therefore, because we accept the framing of the Eight Sahara. When someone points out a flaw, we're like, no, we don't have that flaw. And we fight back. We get defensive. The Eight Sahara wants us to have this really inflated ego. Oh, you're so wonderful. You're fantastic. You're flawless. You're beautiful. You're terrific. No, no need to no, address anything. Oh, you're good. And anyone else that makes an incursion into your little cocoon... That's an enemy. They're pointing out flaws. They're an enemy. Got to quickly hit them back, bludgeon them on their head. The answer creates a framework where we're very fragile. We're fragile because we're, 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 so, we're, we're so married to this idea that, that we, we cannot accept anything bad about ourselves. And any criticism, we view that as an attack from some sort of nefarious actor that wishes us harm. And Yitzhak wants us to live in this rosy fantasy. We're perfect, we're flawless. And we'll lose out on all those opportunities to grow, to change, to improve. Yitzhak doesn't want us to address our flaws, to upgrade. But of course, we all realize that that's, that's silly, and that's foolish, and that's dangerous. And if we want to improve, and we want to transform ourselves, we have to be willing to accept the fact that there is room for improvement and we're not perfect. And there are vast swaths of ourselves that need radical improvement. And when someone points that out, we have to be happy. We have to love it. You should love the rebuke, not just tolerate it. Okay, I hate your guts, but you know what? You have a point. I appreciate you. Let me give you a wet, juicy kiss. Thank you so much for pointing out my flaws. The definition of someone who loves rebuke, someone who accepts rebuke, that's someone who desires truth and desires improvement. And that part of their agenda outweighs their own petty little ego. Typically, the ego, that just towers over all. But when your desire for improvement outweighs that, then you love rebu re rebuke. And you'll be thankful to anyone who brings anything that you can improve into your attention. And the truth is, just to be fair, you can make an argument that this is coming in vogue in America. Everyone's got a therapist, apparently. And after all, what's therapy? Therapy is... I, I'm committed. I realize I have flaws and I want to improve and I'm even willing to pay for that. So maybe the stigma associated with, with trying to fundamentally address your flaws and improve them, maybe that is breaking away. So the, the concept I think we are getting a bit closer to, the concept of the imperative of, of, of criticism and, and maybe done in, in, in packaged in a nice way that's more tolerable, it's more palatable, you know, the, the Talmud gives us all these instructions about how we're supposed to give rebuke. The, the Torah does say, you should give rebuke to your fellow man. 
you have to find a way to do that. You got to navigate through all the obstacles to give rebuke because you know everyone's got this little fort in which they're defending the the heartland. And the heartland is their own little ego. And you want to help someone improve, even if they know that they need to improve. You have to do it in a way that they're really receptive to it. You have to find a way that they know that you're, you're coming at them for their own best interest. You care about them and you love them. And that's why you want to help them to find out where, where, they're, where they're, they can improve. You know, if you see someone who has uh, a hole in his pocket and all his money's dripping out, if you tell them, hey, buddy, you got a, you got a problem because you're losing all your money, they'll be very thankful to you, right? That's what you're doing when you're giving criticism. You have so much opportunity. You're a human. You have the ability to be greater than angels. You're not standing. You're not. You're dynamic. You can improve, change, transform. That's worth more than all the money in the world. But you're not doing it because you have a flaw. Okay, address this. Be aware of it and try to fix it. Stitch up the hole. But that's not how they're going to perceive it. So you have to be very clever, very skillful, very deft at trying to get the message across so it's accepted, so it is received. They have to know that you're, you're, you're telling this to them for their best interest. You don't have this agenda. You're not just trying to pump up your own ego to say, oh, look at me, I'm so much better. <laughs> look, you have all these flaws. There are different ways to criticize the most common way of criticism. And the reason why it's so, we have such a negative association with it is because people who have very fragile and weak self-esteems on their own, they feel better about themselves when they can point out the flaws of everyone else. So let me denigrate them and point out their flaws and then I'll feel better about myself because relative to them, I'm, I'm pretty good. That sort of criticism, not only is not a fulfillment of the mitzvah and it won't work, it's a sin because you're just creating enmity between you and your fellow man. And the Talmud goes as far as to say, just as it is a mitzvah to give criticism that works, it is a mitzvah to withhold from criticism that does not work. So if you're going to point out someone's mistakes and just lay it into them nice and hard, It's a mitzvah to not do that because that's not advancing the agenda, not theirs, not yours, not the Torah's. The commentaries tell us something very interesting. You should surely rebuke your fellow man. Rebuke, rebuke them. Criticize, criticize them. Even a hundred times. Even a hundred times. Now, when we read that, we're like, oh man, I should just take a club and hit them in the head. I, you sinner, you heathen, you heretic, you miscreant. That's what we think. And you just badger them until they're just bloodied up by your attacks. Commentaries tell something very, very interesting, an interpretation of this Talmud. If you have a criticism that you want to convey, do it a hundred times. Not to do the same thing over and over a hundred times, but to take the criticism and find the hundred steps that you, if you could break this up into a hundred little steps, that at the end of a hundred steps, they could actually accept it and have a path to improve. That's what it means a hundred times. Meaning you have to figure out, okay, maybe the first 20 or 30 steps are me bolstering, strengthening, buttressing my relationship with them taking them out for coffee, buying them a Slurpee for the kids, making sure that they know I really love them, investing that time to make sure that the there are no doubts as to my motivation, and then just pointing it out, maybe in a circuitous way, maybe getting them to talk about someone else that would have like a theoretical thing, coming out at them very gently. Break up your mission into a hundred different pieces. That's what it means to rebuke them a hundred times. To do a hundred efforts 
and to think logically, okay, well, I'm going to come attack them and they're going to resist and push back. Well, that's not fulfilling, fulfilling the mitzvah. You got to do it a hundred times. Figure out what are the hundred steps that would result in them actually accepting it and taking the lesson to heart. We see in the Torah two examples of this. At the end of Jacob's life, he gathers his sons for his last <laughs> message to them. His last will and testament, he's on his deathbed, chapter 49 of, of Genesis, and he gives them a blessing. And to his first three sons, Reuven, Shimon, and Levi, he gives them criticism. So the first thing we can note is that criticism we read it, it's criticism. He points out their flaws. Reuven, you're impetuous and you made these mistakes and I'm going to take away the kingdom and the firstborn right and you would have been the priest and you're losing it all. That is heavy criticism. And the Torah calls that a blessing. Shimon Levi, your, your anger and, and your violence, you stole from Asaph. I'm going to scatter you amongst the nations so you, you don't rise up to cause destruction. And the Torah calls that blessing. Only if you have this perception of love and rebuke, of seeing the beauty and the gift that is rebuke, only then can you understand what Jacob is telling them as a blessing. He's giving them rebuke, and it's a blessing. It's a blessing on par with the blessing given to Judah that you will be a king to rule over the whole nation. But how does Jacob do it? He does it on his deathbed. And the Talmud gives us four reasons why he waited till he was on his deathbed. If you do it at the end of your life, you'll definitely do it only once, because then you die, right? So if you wait till then, you're not going to do it twice. You want to give criticism, and you want to make sure that it's going to be received by the recipient. You do it twice to think you have an agenda. You do it once, okay, maybe that's enough. After you receive criticism from someone, even if it's good criticism, you're a bit embarrassed. Every, every time you see them, you're remembering the, 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 the sting, so to speak, of the criticism. If they're on their deathbed and they die, you don't have that problem. If someone gives you criticism, you may harbor ill will against them. Well, not if they're on the deathbed when they gave that to you. And the Talmud concludes, if you give criticism, even if it's Jacob, and everyone knows his intentions are noble. It could still cause alienation. And Jacob was worried, if I rebuke Reuven before my deathbed, he may abandon me, and he may join Asaph. Jacob was very careful in how he gave this blessing. It is a blessing, yes, 100%. But it's a blessing done properly. It's a blessing done with following the very specific criteria of how to deliver rebuke so it will be accepted and make it actually constructive criticism. And Moshe, at the end of his life, he does the same thing. And the Talmud says, how did Moshe know to give rebuke at the end of your life? He learned from Jacob. And the first three Parshios, the first three Torah sections of the book of Devarim Deuteronomy, it's Moshe going through the events of the previous 40 years and pointing out all the mistakes of the nation. And he does it gently. And he does it with only hinting at their mistakes to allow them to save face, to preserve their honor. He's approaching this subject very delicately, very gently. And he's, Rashi even points this out, he is highlighting all of the contributions that he did to the nation. It was after the wars of Sihon and Og. Rashi says, well, why is that important? Because if it was beforehand, they would say, oh, he's just trying to get under our skin. He's just trying to denigrate us for his own purposes. He doesn't really care for us. So Moshe waits until he wins some world wars for their benefit. And now everyone knows that Moshe has their interests at heart, now maybe there's grounds for criticism. And that is, in fact, a great blessing. 
it can give you insight and direction. It can give a spotlight on where you need to improve and where you need to progress from there forward. And there's really two parts of this, if you think about it. To love rebuke, there's the conceptual part where you, I want to hear, I want to improve. I want to learn of what, where I need to improve. I understand the imperative for improvement, mm -hmm. and I want you to tell me if there is room for improvement. That's the general idea. And specifically, we need to be told what areas we need improvement in. And this could come from very unlikely sources. Rabbi Israel Salanter quoted a verse in Psalms, chapter 92. When enemies ascend upon me, tishmana oznai, my ear will listen. What does this verse mean? What's King David referring to in this Psalm, chapter 92 of Psalms, verse 12? When the enemies, they rise up against me, that's, I'm going to listen, I'm going to pay attention. So Rabbi Israel Salanta interpreted this verse as saying that sometimes your enemies will tell you what your friends won't tell you. Because your friends, they don't want to, they don't want to offend you, and they don't want to cause daylight between you and them. And therefore, they, they see your flaw, but they, they don't have the heart to tell you about it. Your enemies who hate you, who want to just stick it to you, well, they may be revealing to you your flaws. So when the enemies ascend upon you, my ear will listen. Pay very careful attention to what your enemies say about you because they may be unwittingly helping you. If you love criticism, you love rebuke, this way to wisdom, you can listen very, very carefully when your enemies talk about you because they may be giving you a gift on par with the blessing of Jacob with the blessing of Moshe on his deathbed. They're revealing to you what you need to do to improve. They're pointing out that you're shedding, you're, you're, you're losing all these, these coins are popping out of your pocket. The enemies don't not notice that, of course, but if you have this perception of, of rebuke as a gift, maybe the gift wrap is not as pleasant. <laughs> it's not as, uh, it's, it's, it's not as, alluring of a gift, but it is a gift. It's a painful gift, but it's a valuable gift, more valuable than any other. Your enemies talk about you. Pay very, very careful attention. Your friends, they love you. They may hesitate to tell you these things. When your enemies talk, you are best advised to listen very carefully. In Genesis chapter 4, we have a terrible event. We have a murder Cain and Abel, two sons of Adam and Eve, they each bring a sacrifice, and uh, Cain brings a sacrifice, Abel brings a sacrifice, Cain's sacrifice is rejected by God, whereas Abel's sacrifice is accepted, and Cain is depressed, and he's sad, and he's despondent, and God speaks to him, he says, why are you sad, why are you crestfallen? If you just improve, well, things will improve. You'll ascend. And the commentaries tell us, God's telling Cain, like, why are you crestfallen? Imagine God rejects your offering. Is there anything more depressing in the world than your, your brother, right? The brat. Your brother. His sacrifice is accepted and yours is rejected. There's nothing more depressing than that. So the Arachim there explains that Cain was given the most valuable insight. He was given criticism. He was told that your offering was not wholehearted. It wasn't with full devotion. And that's why it was, it was rejected. And now you know what you need to do. Now your agenda is laid out before you. Next time you give a gift, do it wholeheartedly with full devotion. And then it will be accepted. So this is something to celebrate. It's a gift. It's a blessing. And he, of course, interpreted it as criticism, as a punishment, and that's why he was crestfallen. But God is giving us, and of course, Cain, a very powerful message. Your offering was rejected because it was subpar. 
It wasn't the choices of fruit. There wasn't that same level of dedication that is required to give a gift, so to speak, to God. And this is not a reason to be crestfallen. God rejected you. God slapped you in the face, so to speak. You received some divine criticism, but now you know what you need to do to improve. You were given a little divine window into the, the pathway that leads to your perfection. You have a roadmap now. You know what you need to do. Most of us are flying blind. We have all these flaws we need to improve in, and we don't know because we're, we have all these hangups in trying to identify our flaws. So a good friend will help us. A good enemy will help us. A slap in the face from God will help us. And it's all a gift. And only the those who are wise enough to realize this, they love rebuke. Only those few who understand what we laid out, which is, it's simple. It's not even complicated. You're here to improve, right? Well, improve in where? where? Which areas? You don't know. You're totally ignorant in the most important question in your life. If you love rebuke, it means you really care about improving. Criticism is a gift. A gift that you will benefit from more than any other gift. King Solomon in Proverbs tells us, Hochach lechacham. Criticize a wise person. V'yehavecha, and he will love you. Criticism to the wise actually is something which is cherished. And they'll love you for it because they understand how valuable it actually is. But of course, even to the wise person, if they get a sense that you're doing it for your own agenda, they're not going to accept it. It's heartfelt. If it's truly out of that person's own interest, it's for their benefit. And if they sense that, then they will love you for it. It is interesting. In the aftermath of the golden calf, God says to Moshe, I want to destroy this people. And he effectively says, Moshe, you're going to be the, 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 the new forefather of the new nation. And we're done with everyone else. The, 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 the golden calf, they're done. They're unsalvageable. But the verse says, very interesting. This is chapter 32 of Exodus, verse 9 and 10. God tells Moshe, Behold, I saw this nation. Vihine am kshe'oref hu. It's a stiff-necked, stubborn nation. And now, because of that, let me destroy them. And the question is obvious. Wait a minute. We have a sin of titanic proportions. Just a couple of days after the sign of revelation, we have a golden calf. We have idolatry. Let's go back to Egypt. This is your God, O Israel. What? The Talmud compares that to a, a bride committing adultery under the wedding canopy. Like it's totally indefensible. That was the crime of the golden calf. And God says, I want to destroy them. Why? Because they're a stiff-necked, stubborn people. No, because they did this terrible sin. That's not what God says. God doesn't say, I'm going to destroy them because of the, of the golden calf. I'm going to destroy them because they are stubborn. They are intransigent. They are stiff-necked. Why is that the grounds for the, at least the, 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 what didn't happen, right? The counterfactual. That's what I was looking for. Counterfactual. Reality, where God would have destroyed them, it would have been because of the fact that we're stiff-necked. <laughs> what about the fact that they did the golden calf? Commentaries tell something unbelievable. If a person is a sinner, that is a problem that can be fixed. Even if a person does egregious sins, there's the concept of improvement, of repentance, of confession. There, there's, a, there, there's a path to improve. But all that depends upon a person's willingness to accept the fact they made a mistake. The golden calf, it's a terrible sin, does not render you insalvageable. But if you say I'm stiff-necked, if you are stubborn and not willing to accept any criticism, okay, well then you'll stay a sinner forever. So that is grounds 
to remove them. That's the idea over here. Criticism, it opens up all the doorways to improvement. If you're not willing to accept your own flaws, then you'll forever remain wallowing in your mistakes and in your sins. You'll never be able to get past them. And a good friend is someone who's brave enough to tell you where you went wrong. Earlier in our book, chapter 2 of the Chapters of the Fathers, the great Rabbi Yochanan Mitzakri asked his students, go find the right path. What's the best path that you should choose in life? And Rabbi Yoshua, Rabbi Joshua said, Chaver Tov, a good friend. And the commentators there explain. What does it mean to have a good friend? Like, how is that going to help you in life? A good friend is one who will point out your flaws. The best friend is the one that really gives you the most valuable gifts. Someone who you know has your back, who cares for you, who is invested in your well-being, who is invested in, in your improvement, and your advancement, and they're even willing to tell you the very unpleasant things that you need to hear. If you have a good friend, you have a chance. Because the friend, while well, they're the outsider, they don't have that same Yetzirah for someone else, right? Our Yetzirah deludes us vis-a-vis -vis ourselves, but not vis-a-vis -vis someone else. We, we have clarity when it comes to looking at everyone else's flaws. So a good friend could be a way to circumvent the Yetzirah. And our sages are telling us, if you want Torah, one of the ways to do it, way number 34, is to not only tolerate and accept rebuke and criticism, but to love it. If you want Torah, you're trying to understand the Almighty's wisdom, and you want to make an interpretation, and you want to say some novel idea, you want to understand something in Torah, it could be right, it could be wrong. And if it's wrong, you're in big trouble because you are misinterpreting the Word of God. If you make a mistake, mistakes are, you know, they're, they're a reality in life. But if you make a mistake and you misinterpret the Word of God, that's a terrible thing. But if you have good friends, they can say, wait a minute, there's something wrong with that argument. And there's evidence against that argument. Well, you could arrive at the truth. You want Torah. One of the ways to do that is to love criticism because you're like, oh, wow, thank you for pointing that out to me. I'm so appreciative of that. Let's go back to the drawing board. The Talmud even tells us that no sage achieves accuracy in Torah unless they initially blundered, unless there was some initial failure. You can never get it perfectly right on the first try. We're all fallible. We are all liable to err. But we're not condemned to always have it wrong. Only if we refuse to accept criticism, only then will we be forever mired in error, in, in, in mistakes. And that, of course, applies throughout the entire spectrum of our life in our life, in our character, in our agenda, in our direction, in trajectory in life. And certainly when it comes to Torah, we all benefit tremendously from this wonderful gift called criticism. Again, it has to be done properly, delivered properly, but it is truly a gift and a blessing. And of course, a way to achieve Torah. Way number 34, loving, rebuke. Please send me your criticism to rabbiwalbajima.com, not just for this, but for anything you hear from me, if you think it's wrong, I will appreciate you badgering me and bludgeoning me and pointing out the flaws. Some people, when they listen to the podcast, are like, oh, I disagree with the rabbi, and they write an email, which is great. And then I write a response, and sometimes we have to amend it. No big deal. But then you have other people who say, well, I don't know, they made this mistake and I think they're wrong. And they just don't send me the email. Gotta send me the email. Rabbi, we'll be gmail .com. I want to hear. I want to hear. I'll take your rebuke. It's got to be accurate though. Don't just snipe at me. Okay, it's fine also. Even if you snipe at me, that's fine. 
rabbojima.com. Your questions, your comments, your criticism is appreciated. I am awaiting at my inbox to hear from you.